Hello, everyone. This is Nivel Akwe, um, your co-director for the course Fundamentals of Natural Resource Governance. Today's session is on Model 3 and the linkages investment and diversification. This was looked at during last Tuesday's live session where Mr. Demba took us through the relationship between extractive industry and the various linkages um, that should drive um, sustainable development. So today, I want us to go through the presentation to grant us further understanding of the various linkages um, within the resource value chain. The objective of this course or this model is to expose participants to have better understanding of the various opportunities that can be a catalyst in the transformation of natural resources into sustainable development. Also, we will have the opportunity to go through the various challenges that impede African economies mainly from achieving this, that's achieving sustainable development through their mineral resource endowment, despite decades or even in other jurisdictions, century, over a century of mineral production. We also look at the strategies that we can adopt in order to drive industrialization through mineral resources. So here we have the table of contents, the opportunities and requirements, challenges and current, and current gaps, the possible strategies, and we will conclude with the issue of local content. So I will start by saying that um, the other school of thought or opponents of the energy transition usually come from the perspective that the West or the advanced countries have managed to industrialize using their fossil fuels. And this is the time for Africa to do same. So why do we have to leave our fossil fuels underground and pursue energy transition? This thought alone, let us understand the potential opportunity that extractive resources present to owners or present to resource rich economies to drive industrialization. And the African Union's Agenda 2063 does not mean worse with this. The achievement of the Pan African vision the achievement of the African industrialization agenda will be driven by its own people and by its own natural resources. It tells you that despite being non-renewable, despite being depletable, natural resources, uh, for the purpose of our discussion, mineral resources uh, contains enormous potential to drive Africa's industrialization agenda. But what do we have in our context? Usually, our context is characterized by extraction of minerals and exportation of minerals in its raw form without any value addition. The mineral sector or extractive sector generally within our context is treated like an enclave where only a few elites who possess the requisite skills and foreign expatriates are involved in the production of extractive resources. This alienates the entire sector from the rest of the economy without any form of sectorial linkages to ensure that mineral development have a spillover effect in developing other sectors of the economy in a manner such that in, the, in case of the depletion of um, mineral resources, 
other sectors of the economy will equally be vibrant to support spend, public spending and smoothing our budget expenditures, as well as yielding benefits to the future generation. One key thing we have to note is that usually investors are profit driven. And so they are not so much interested in uh, where the inputs or resources they use to engage in resource extraction come from. Their focus is on the end goal. That is the product, the final product they will be able to extract, whether being it the mineral or or whether the infrastructure exists to add value, to get the final product to export. But of course, wherever the resources or the raw materials come from to meet certain required standards, industry standards. The question is, do we have the requisite capacity or do we have the requisite infrastructure to produce these raw materials and supply our investors to enable them engage in meaningful development of mineral resources? Mostly the question is, the answer is no. This provides an opportunity for us to begin to rethink the management of our mineral resource value chain and domesticate the, rele the relevant inputs and raw materials that are needed to ensure an efficient and effective production of mineral resources. Currently, significant portion of mineral of raw materials and inputs, including human resources, are imported from the West in order to ensure the development of our natural resources. This is because we do not have the requisite inputs, neither do we have the human resource that possess the technical capacity and competence to be recruited into the production of mineral resource and even to engage in procurement in supplying the relevant inputs and services that are required to ensure effective production. So this pie chart is a distribution of the expenditures in extractive projects. If you study it carefully, I want you to focus on the green portion which contains significant portion of extractive expenditures, which is employment, infrastructure, and procurement. So you realize that significant amount of investors' um, expenditures go into employment, infrastructure, and procurement. In the oil and gas, this is about half of the total investment Whereas in the mining, the amount can be more, between 50 and 65%. So as I mentioned earlier, this presents an almost opportunity for us within employment. It provides an almost opportunity for us within infrastructure provision. It provides an almost opportunity for us in the area of um, procurement. So we have this chart. The blue, the, the, the area highlighted blue is the extractive value chain. We have gone through the extractive um, value chain uh, during model one of this course. The yellow portion highlights the various opportunities along the various stages of the value chain. And if you study it carefully, you can see so much are done at each stage of the value chain. At exploration, we had geophysical and drilling. 
equipment, intellectual service, etc. And when we come down here, you have exploration services, we have geological uh, services, analytics, information processing, and financing. The question again is, in our local economies, do we have the requisite skills and competencies to supply these inputs that are needed to undertake an effective exploration um, and, and, and feasibility ahead or prior to the extraction of minerals? Unfortunately, we do not, um, when we come to our contest, not much emphasis is placed on research and development. This undermines our capacity to come out with innovation or innovative technological advancement and all that to be able to develop our capacity, the capacity of our human resource to be able to um, develop the requisite infrastructure to be able to come up with some of these technical intensive equipment that are required to ensure an effective exploration. Unfortunately, most of these inputs are imported. What is even worrying is the fact that significant tax exemptions are granted on the importation of these inputs. So we do not only miss the opportunity to supply this input in order to make um, the most out of um, uh, service provision or supply of raw materials. At the same time, we also miss out or forego significant tax revenues due to excessive tax exemptions granted on these um, 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 equipment that are imported by um, uh, extractive companies. The story is no different at the other stages within the value chain, extraction, processing, refining, and manufacturing. There are so many opportunities that the local economy can take advantage of. But like I mentioned earlier, our capacity is woefully below what is required by the industry standard. So most often you find our human resource participating in the low hanging areas, maybe administrative tasks and all that. But when it comes to the technical areas, which are of higher value and more rewarding, you would rather find expatriates occupying these positions, or you rather find foreign companies supplying these um, um, sophisticated equipment. With this limited capacity, even a well-constructed local content policy may not be sufficient to be able to bridge the supply gap or to be able to bridge the employment gap because the skill is not there, because the technology does not exist locally. So this significantly undermines efforts made at local content, even where the policy exists. You can take your time and study the various opportunities. You can refer to the, you can refer to the reading list to um, understand some of these opportunities and make use and see how countries can make use of them, especially in the development of their local content. All right, so moving on to the next um, uh, section, we have opportunities and requirements. So I've already taken us through how the value chain works and the various opportunities that the various stages within the value chain present, as well as um, 
So moving on, I would want us to go through the various the actions that are required for capacity development in bridging the gap. 